Today, Sylvie and I are in the Hertfordshire village of Wheat Hampstead, which lies about two or three miles to the north of the city of St Albans, and it's situated on the River Lee. We're setting off on a walk by heading south, up a road known as the hill. And today's walk is going to be quite a long one, but it's also going to feature quite a lot of history and some interesting stories, especially for those of you who are film and TV fans. The weather forecast for today is very warm, with, hopefully, plenty of sunshine at some point. Although we've got plenty of water with us, we're expecting to make a few pit stops on the way. Well, once we're out of the village, the hill levels off and then takes us down to a place called No Man's Land Common. Several historical events occurred on the common. During the Wars of the Roses, the Second Battle of St Albans took place not far from here and the Earl of Warwick's army retreated to the common. And on the 13th of June 1660, Catherine Ferrers, the legendary female highway robber, was believed to have carried out her last robbery here on the common when she was shot and mortally wounded. She fled on horseback to her home near Marquiat, where she later died. And a road through the common now bears her name as does the nearby pub, The Wicked Lady. A 1981 film of the same name, starring Faye Dunaway, was also made in the locality. Another less well-known event was in 1833, when hundreds of spectators arrived on the common to watch a bare-knuckle fight between English champion James Burke and an Irish champion named Simon Byrne. The bout went on for over three hours and lasted no fewer than 99 rounds, by which time Burke had beaten Simon Byrne to a pulp. Byrne collapsed and later died due to heavy bleeding on the brain. We're now leaving No Man's Land and heading east along Drover's Lane. This lane eventually brings us onto Coleman Green Lane and we walk along here a couple of hundred yards before turning onto a footpath and heading southeast across country. We stop for a moment just to take in the view across the countryside. It's lovely to see miles and miles of green fields. The footpath eventually leads us up to a place called Hammond's Farm and we have to pass through the farmyard and out through the gate.
This brings us out onto Hammonds Lane, but we only walk a short distance along here before turning onto another footpath beside this lovely thatched cottage. The footpath eventually brings us into Simmons Hyde Great Wood and we cut through the wood and come out onto Simmons Hyde Lane. This lane brings us onto Cooper's Green Lane which turned out to be a lot busier than it used to be years ago. Fortunately, we find a footpath that runs along the same route and gets us off the busy road for part of the way. I can see blue sky, so it looks as if we might get some sunshine soon. We emerge back out onto Cooper's Green Lane and our next destination is in sight, the town of Hatfield. We cut through Great Breach Lane and head towards the town. We're going to pass through the new town as it's the old town that we're actually going to visit. We're turning into a side street beside the Great Northern Pub and head down into the old town. Hatfield Old Town, or Bishop's Hatfield as it's also known, lies on the eastern edge of the new town and it's steeped in history. This brings us out onto Park Street, which is the main road running through the town. When we come to the junction with 4th Street, we come across a very interesting pub, the Eight Bells, and it's a pub which has a place in literary history. Well, it's turning into a very hot day, so it's time for a pit stop. Charles Dickens actually stayed at this pub in the 1830s, and he liked it so much that it inspired him to include it in his upcoming novel, Oliver Twist. When Bill Sykes murdered Nancy, he fled from London up the Great North Road until he reached Hatfield and it was here that he sought sanctuary at the pub. Well, after a refreshing pint, we have a quick look round the village.
Well now we set off up the steep hill known as Four Street. When we reach the top of Fourth Street, we head into St. Etheldreda's Church. This church is emotional memories for me, as my mother's funeral was held here 40 years earlier. But I wanted to show Sylvie a spectacular monument that stands inside the church. This monument is to a man named Robert Cecil, who was the first Earl of Salisbury, and he served as Secretary of State under Elizabeth I and later James I. The monument was created by the renowned 17th century sculptor Maximilian Colt and the four kneeling figures are meant to represent the four cardinal virtues justice, prudence, temperance and fortitude. Robert Cecil was effectively the King's spymaster and is historically credited to have been the person who uncovered the infamous gunpowder plot, which was a plan to assassinate James I by blowing up the opening of Parliament. But many now believe that Cecil himself may have orchestrated the plot in the first place, not as an attempt to assassinate the King, but an attempt to frame prominent Catholic rebels and, in the process, elevate his importance in the eyes of James I. And the plot thickens, as they say. Well, after that fascinating tour of the church, we take a quick walk round the scenic churchyard.
After we leave the churchyard, we come to the side entrance of Hatfield Park. There is an entrance fee which varies depending on what you actually want to see. We only have time to visit the park and the gardens, and Hatfield House itself will have to wait for another day. Hatfield House is a fine example of Jacobean architecture and it was built in 1611 by Robert Cecil, whose monument we've just previously looked at. It's currently owned and lived in by the Gascoigne Cecil family, but it's open to the public. The house is often used as a filming location and has featured in many films and television dramas.
This building is the original old palace and it was here that Elizabeth I lived until she became queen in 1558. Normally the old palace is open to the public but due to Covid it's left a backlog of events which are normally held here and it was closed on the day of our visit. Sylvie and I are heading out into the park which extends out over quite a large area but sadly we don't have time to walk round all of it but just as we set out Sylvie finds an ice cream van ah, and I've noticed she's only bought one Hatfield Park is home to a considerable number of ancient oak trees and history records that Elizabeth I was sat under one of these oaks when she was informed of the death of the current monarch Queen Mary. Elizabeth had now succeeded to the throne. We spent about an hour and a half at Hatfield House, but now it was time to continue with our walk. So we head out through the main gate. We walk out across the new town towards our next destination, Hatfield Business Park. Hatfield Business Park has only been in existence for about 20 years and before that it was an aerodrome. Initially built in the 1930s as an aircraft factory for Hawker Sidleys. Famous aircraft such as the Gypsy Moth and the Mosquito Bomber were manufactured here and it later became British Aerospace where the BAE 146 airliners were built in the 1980s. The aerodrome shut down in 1994 when it was turned into a business park and a housing estate but at least they've retained the old control tower. But this site also has another history and it's one that few of its modern residents probably even know about. We walk through the modern residential area until we reach a large area of heathland and even Sylvie didn't know what happened here over 20 years ago.
In the late 1990s, a few years after the aerodrome shut down, Steven Spielberg moved onto the site and he built a replica French village here. And it was here that he filmed most of the scenes for his war epic, Saving Private Ryan. The meadows were again later used for many of the scenes for the series Band of Brothers. Well, with that movie nostalgia tour complete, Sylvia and I set off on our long walk back to Wheat Hampstead. We've passed through Hatfield Garden Village and are now heading along Green Lanes. Green Lanes eventually brings us to the village of Lemsford, but we're not stopping here. Instead, we head in a northwesterly direction along what's known as the Marford Road. We walk only a few hundred yards along this road before we reach a pub named the Crooked Chimney. It's a very warm day, so it's time for another pit stop. The Crooked Chimney gained fame in the 1990s when it was featured in the classic TV series Inspector Morse. An episode of Inspector Morse was filmed in Brockett Park, directly opposite the pub. Morse and his sidekick Lewis were both seen entering the Crooked Chimney for a beer. Well, suitably refreshed, we set off again on the next leg of our walk. But just behind the pub is a small country lane, known as Cromerhyde Lane, and that's where we're going. Chroma Hyde Lane only goes for about half a mile before turning into a trackway and at this point we branch off and head across country towards our next destination. The footpath takes us about a mile before we reach a place called Coleman Green and it's here we stop at a pub called the John Bunyan which was named after the 17th century Baptist preacher. During our walks Sylvia and I see a lot of interesting things and we also meet a lot of interesting people. Well today was no exception. When we arrived at the John Bunyan we met a very colourful character named Antonio. Now Antonio had apparently cycled all the way from South End in Essex and now didn't actually know where he was. Um, and by the time we got to the pub he'd already had a few beers and now he was in the process of demolishing an entire bottle of champagne. Let's have a cheer. Let's have a cheers. Come on, I ain't no fit again drinking log and hawking digging two pints of log and packet of crisps. All right, something like that then. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Come yeah. on. Oh, cheers. Sexy. 
you sexy you are. <laughs> Listen. Well, we had a delightful drink with Antonio, but now it was time to move on. Um, Sylvia and I were hoping that he manages to get back to Southend all right. Before we leave Coleman Green, Sylvia and I cross the lane to look at an unusual relic. This chimney stack is all that remains of the building where John Bunyan used to hold his sermons back in the 17th century. Well, we're now setting off on the last leg of our walk and we take the footpath which runs behind the pub. This footpath brings us briefly onto Beach Hyde Lane before we cross over onto another footpath. The fields beside this footpath form what was once part of a massive Iron Age hill fort and this was once the capital of the local tribe known as the Catavalorni. In a few minutes I'm going to take Sylvie into the only remaining visible remnants of the hill fort. We cut through a gap in the hedgerow and down some steps and this brings us down into a deep gulch known as Devil's Dyke and this once formed part of the ramparts of the hill fault. In 54 BC, when Julius Caesar came to Britain on his second expedition, it's believed that he engaged in battle right here against the Catavalorni tribe and defeated them. And local street names commemorate his victory. Well, we finally emerged from Devil's Dyke and back into the village of Wheat Hampstead. It's been an exhausting eight hour walk covering over 18 miles, but we look forward to seeing you on our next walk.